here this morning? Yes? Are you happy to be here this morning? All right. It was nice to see you. I'll tell you what, this is uh, the first time this week at least. Well, I guess it would be the first since the first day of the week. But it's a good, good time for us to come together and to worship the, the Lord our God. He is certainly worthy of praise. And no matter what we've been going through, he's still worthy of praise. And our best chance to praise him is through uh, your voices this morning. I'd like for us to lift our voices all in one, uh, as one body and to just worship, thank him for what he's done, sing songs about him, sing songs to him. So I'd ask you if you would, first song, stand after the first song, you may be seated. And let's sing, send the light.
stand up here and see y'all when y'all were standing like we had a full house. <laughs> we're going to sing a new song to us, probably a new song to you. Uh, so it doesn't go quite as smooth as I'd like it to. Just pay attention to the words. Think about what God has done for you as we sing at your name. As we all sing. <laughs> Jesus is our God. We will 
Shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. The Lord of all the earth will shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name. God is good, is he not? We have time for one person, one person to stand up and tell what God has done for them. One person. You get, you get two seconds. Come on up. One person.
for your grace Lord for blessing us in ways that we should not be blessed in ways that we do not deserve Lord you're an awesome God we know you're a sovereign God a God that is in charge of all things and even in this crazy world we live in you're still in charge Amen. we know how the story ends Lord we can get through anything with your help we pray that you'll help us Lord not only to make it through these hard times but to actually blossom and become the church and the Christians that you would have us to be. Help us to be, Lord, the, the witness that you want us to be, the comfort that you want us to be, the light that shines in the darkness. I pray that you'll bless this service. Pray that our worship so far has been pleasing to you. Lord, just be with us. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. We had a short little powwow down here, but uh, that uh, relates to something at the end of the service. We actually are going to have baptism at the conclusion of the service, and I'll explain that and how that's going to happen and uh, give you more information uh, when we get to the end. And so uh, that will take place probably somewhere around 1145. So, uh, But if you have your Bibles today, turn uh, back again to the book of 1 Thessalonians. We continue in our study this uh, letter of encouragement uh, that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church there, uh, those believers that live in Thessalonica. And today I want to talk about uh, the evidence of election or the evidence of divine election. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 4 through 10. But I want to begin with verse 1 give a little uh, update of where we've been. Paul writes this letter along, he says, with Silas and Timothy. He writes to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and Father, our God and Father. Now, last week uh, in these verses we looked at the characteristics of a strong church. So I want to remind you of those. I'm going to put those on the screen so we'll look at those briefly. Remember we said a strong church was a church of the people a church that's founded in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. A strong church is a church that manifests the supreme gifts of grace and peace. A strong church believes in and promotes prayer. A strong church is faithful uh, in the Lord's work. And then number six, which was taken from verse number four, a strong church gives evidence of being God's chosen people. And I told you last week we wouldn't cover that. There was too much there that we would cover that this week. And that's what we're going to do. And so we begin in verse 4. This is our text for today. Knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. As you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, 
not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned from, to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Amen. What verses? Now, Paul said in verse 4, he said, Knowing your election by God. And if you have a different translation than the, New, than the King James or the New King James, yours will read a little bit differently there. It may not use the word election. It may use the word chosen. That we know, brothers and sisters, that you are chosen by God or that God has chosen you. The word election means to choose. It means to select for oneself. It means to, to pick out, to select out. Paul is saying to these believers, he says, you know, we know, we have no doubt that you have been chosen by God, that you have been selected by God. Now, who are the elect? Well, the elect of God, uh, the chosen of God are those who have placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. The elect or the, ch or the chosen ones are those who have been saved by grace through faith. Now, a lot of people try to get into all of these arguments about, you know, election and when it takes place and all that. And the Bible says, you know, we were chosen before the foundation of the world. And, and you can dig real deep into that. And oftentimes, some, you know, people will, will sometimes get a little confused and they'll get a little worried and they'll say, well... You know, I've, I've placed my faith in Christ, and I trust Him as my Savior, but, but, I, you know, but, but I'm not sure if, whether I'm one of the elect or not. What, what, if I've, what if I've put my faith in Christ, and I'm not one of the elect? Well, let me just assure you of this. If you've placed your faith in Christ, you're one of the elect. Somebody will then say, well, well what about some of those? What about him, or what about her? Well, what if she's not the elect? Well... You know, they're not the elect if they choose not to place their faith in Christ. I think it's a very simple way to look at it. Now, we could get into real deep theology and, and, and all of that, and, but I don't, it's not necessary because, listen, if you have placed your faith in Christ, you are the elect of God because you have chosen to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. God has worked in your heart. He's worked in your life. Uh, then you are the chosen ones. And if you're here in this service today and you've never placed your faith in Christ, God works in your heart. The Holy Spirit moves in your heart. And you want to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can. And once you place your faith in Christ, then you become a child of God or what Paul says here, the elect of God. Now, Paul says we know we know that you are the elect of God. How do you know that? Why did he say that? Is it because God gave some special uh, insight? No, because there were some evidences that these people gave that indicated that they were truly saved, that they had truly become the children of God. So don't let that word elect or, or some of these uh, theological words... Uh, throw you off or, or, or cause you confusion. Uh, the, the simple facts are, if you place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, He works in your heart, you express faith, then you're saved by the grace of God as you exercise faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You are part of the elect, the chosen, the family of God, the church of God, the body of Christ, uh, all the same thing. Now, the truth is, if we have placed our faith in Christ and we have been saved by the grace of God, there ought to be evidence in our life that we are the children of God. If there's no evidence, we've got a problem. 
Now, let me say something here uh, about security and assurance. Because you can have the security of salvation but not have the assurance of it. What do I mean by that? When a person places their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they are eternally saved. From that moment forward, you cannot lose your salvation. It's impossible. And I've gone over that in the past. But, but once you're saved, my friend, you're always saved. But you may lack the assurance of it. But that doesn't mean that you're not secure. Security of salvation is from God's perspective, he knows you've placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and you are eternally secure in him. Jesus said you're in my hand and you're in the Father's hand and no one can snatch you out of my Father's hand or out of my hand. You are eternally secure. Assurance comes when we have the confidence in our mind and heart that we are saved and eternally secure. We get that assurance, first of all, by the Word of God, by what the Bible teaches. We have that assurance because the Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts, assuring us that we are the children of God. And we have that assurance as we live our life in obedience to what God's Word says. But my friends, if you don't know the Word of God, you may lack that assurance. If you don't live in obedience to what God says, then you can lack that assurance. But I will tell you this, if you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone as the Savior of your life, then you are eternally secure. Because Jesus said, anyone who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. And God so loved you that He sent His only Son, Jesus, that if you would put your faith in Him, you would not perish but you would have everlasting life. Now, we ought to have that assurance because we ought to be living like the Bible tells us to live and like God tells us to live and doing those things God tells us to do. And that, that helps us to have that assurance. We ought to know the truth of the Word of God and we have that assurance. God knows we are secure in Christ and if we're saved, we ought to have evidence. We ought to show evidence of that. Your life and my life. Now let's look at this in this text today. Uh, we're going to find the genuine evidence of true salvation. As, as Paul writes, and he says, we know, we know, we have confidence that you are the children of God, the elect of God, because of several reasons. Number one, because of receiving God's word joyfully, especially the gospel, in spite of or in the midst of opposition and persecution. That's one of the ways Paul knew. He knew how they responded. It wasn't easy for them to make a choice. It wasn't easy for them in, in, in light of, of the times in which they live to step out in faith and, and put their faith in Jesus Christ. But they did. Paul says in verse 5, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but, but the gospel that we preached to you, he says, came in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. The word power there is the word that we get our word dynamite from. It's dunamis. And it's talking there about the power and the energy of God himself not human strength. And, and, and what, we, what we say and what we share and the gospel that we preach is not done just simply in human power with human words. It is through divine power and divine energy and through the Word of God. The, the gospel message is not just merely words on a piece of paper. The, the, word, the gospel and is, the, is the power of God the Bible says, unto salvation of everyone who believes. It's not just words. It's not just an idea, although words are involved and, and ideas are involved. The gospel is more of that, more than that. The gospel is the power of God at work in the human heart 
with the Holy Spirit that applies that word, that stirs in the heart, that convicts a person of their sin, and that energizes a person to believe and to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you think about it for just a moment. Do you remember back to the time that you were saved? You remember that time? Was there a time in your life that you go back to and you remember a, a time when, when you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? I would say that if you look back at that time, you remember how God stirred in your heart. Now, you may have been young, and you may not have understood it. In fact, some people who are older don't understand it as either. But there's something that happens. There's a stirring of the Holy Spirit in your heart. You're awakened to the fact that you have sinned against the Holy God and that you need a Savior. His name is Jesus. He died on the cross for your sin. He paid for your sin. He rose again, and He lives today. Sits at the right hand of God the Father. He's coming back one day. But a stirring in your heart, that, that's through the, the power of the gospel and the Holy Spirit who, through His power, works that in your heart to, to energize a person to believe and to become a child of God. The Bible says in Hebrews 4 and verse 12, For the Word of God is living and powerful. My friend, listen, there is no other book on the face of the planet that can ever claim to be living and powerful. Amen. Only the Word of God that's living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, to the joints and marrow, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Romans 1.16, Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, no matter who you are, whether you're a Jew or whether you're a Gentile. The Word of God, the Gospel, is the power of God. And the Holy Spirit is God's power that works in the Word of God. It works in the human heart to bring a person to salvation. Now, in verse 6, Paul says, And you became followers. You came, became followers of us. The word follower there is the word that we get our word mimic from. It's to imitate, to to live like somebody else lives, to follow the pattern of somebody else. And he, he said, you, you began to follow the pattern of, of how we were living our life and, and, and the things that we believe, but not just followers of us, he said, but also of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, having received the word in much affliction and joy of the Holy Spirit. You see, their hearts were ready, and their hearts were receptive. Now, if a heart's not ready and a heart's not receptive, then it doesn't matter what you do, you cannot make somebody believe. You can't trick them into it. You can't force them into it. You can't manipulate it into it. You can't do it for them. But the heart has to be ready. The heart has to be receptive. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the work of the Word of God and the gospel message and the, the messenger, whoever it is, me, you, any, anybody that God uses to influence and to help and to encourage and to, to be an example for somebody else that they might be saved. Now, Paul says you received the, the word, you received the gospel, and you received it joyful. Even in the midst of opposition and, and persecution, and Paul had experienced that. Remember, he had to leave, leave the city because it got so rough. And yet, even though he left, the persecution didn't stop. And yet, the gospel bore fruit. And people trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and uh, the church was established there. And even though there was opposition and persecution, they gladly received the word of God. And the Holy Spirit rewarded their faith and their commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ by stirring up joy in their heart as they had received the gospel and the word of God and the assurance of their salvation. I think a good question to ask is today is, what has been your response to the gospel? You've heard the gospel message. You've heard it in this church. You've heard it other places. Maybe somebody's presented it to you. What has been your response to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you believe he is the Son of God? Do you believe that he is the, the Savior? that he is the one and only, the one and only way to God the Father, that you cannot be saved except you come through Jesus, you can't go to heaven 
unless you go through Jesus and faith in Christ alone? What's been your response to the gospel? Have you repented of your sin? Have you confessed your sin before God? That yes, you've sinned and you have no hope for heaven except for Jesus Christ and his death for you on the cross. Have you trusted him? And then what's your attitude toward the word of God? Uh, do you have a hunger for the word of God? Do you receive the word of God when you read it or when you hear it or when it's preached? Do you welcome the, God, the word of God and the truth of God into your life? How do you, what's your approach? What's your attitude toward the word of God? Paul says we know that you are the elect because you've welcomed in the word of God. and You've gladly received it even in the midst of opposition. But here's the second thing. And that is by becoming an example, an example of true faith in God to other people and having a reputation of being a dedicated follower of the Lord. And my friends, if, if somebody says they place their faith in Christ and then you never see them again, they're, they're never a part of the church, they're not, they have no care about Jesus, the things of God, the Word of God, you have good reason to doubt that their salvation was genuine. These believers became an example for others, and they had a reputation. What was their reputation? That they were dedicated followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says in verse 7, You became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. That tells you something about the way these people lived their life day in and day out. He said, you became examples to all those people in, in the northern, northern part of Greece and the southern part of Greece. Uh, they all have heard about you and, and, and how your life has changed and how you live your life differently and how you live day to day and how you live a consistent life of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Our faith shouldn't be something that we leave in the church house when we walk out those doors on Sunday and then try to come back next Sunday and pick it up again. Amen. If we're a Christian and that's, that's who we are, no matter where we go, no matter who we're involved in, and no matter what our business, no matter what the relationship, we are a Christian, right? We are a child of God. We don't leave that anywhere. And we ought to live it everywhere we go. We ought to live who we are and be consistent with our faith in Christ and having become a new creation in Christ Jesus. You know, these Thessalonian believers are really some of the, of the most encouraging believers we read about in the New Testament. Paul writes that their faith in God became known not just in uh, Macedonia or uh, Achaia or, or in that section of the world, but he says... Uh, in everywhere. He says, everywhere I go, I encounter people who have been encouraged by the way that you live your life and by your living faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. My friend, that should be true of us as well. When, we, when people meet us and people get to know us, uh, they ought to know where we stand, who we are, what we believe, and they ought to see a consistency of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not saying we need to be perfect. You know why? Because we, we're not perfect and we can't be perfect. But we ought to have a consistent life, a consistent way in which we live our life. And you know, all of us need, need uh, examples to follow. We, we've all needed that. When, we, when somebody is first saved and, and they become a child of God, you know what, what one thing they really need? They need some examples of who to follow. Because these people became followers of the Apostle Paul. Paul says it to the Philippians, to others, about you know, how people would follow, follow them as they follow Christ. There ought to be an example that you can follow, that you can pattern your life out, out, uh, after. People that will help encourage you to be all that God has called and created you to be. Not a bad example, but a good example. We all need those good examples, but I'll tell you something else. We all need to get to the point to where we are a good example for somebody else, that they can follow after us, pattern themselves after us, that we would be an encouragement to them to be all that God 
has created them to be. Now you'll notice these Thessalonians that once they were saved, they began to live out their faith. I mean, it's once they were saved, they began to live it out. Their lives were changed, and uh, they, they quickly gained a reputation of being followers of Christ. Now, I want to tell you something. These people didn't just get religion. Have you ever heard that before? Have you ever heard that somebody, uh, maybe they were saved, or maybe they had an experience, or whatever it is, and somebody might make a statement like this, Oh, did you hear about old so-and-so? He done got religion. Well, I want to tell you something. If somebody, got, if somebody gets religion, they don't get much. And if all somebody gets is religion, they sure don't get heaven. Or they don't get salvation if all they get is religion. No, these people got more than religion. My friend, listen, they got a relationship. A relationship with God through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. These people got saved. They were born again. They were eternally changed. And they became active in the things of God. And they began to live out their faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they began to share their faith. And they began to speak forth the word of God. Uh, that's what we need to do. We need to share, share our faith. And we need to be able to speak forth God's word into a situation. I mean... If somebody wants to know, why don't you do that? Or why don't you go here? Or, or why don't I hear you talking like everybody else talks? I'm assuming that you don't talk like everybody else talks at work. Amen? Oh, me. And I hope somebody says, well, I don't, I don't, I don't hear you talking like, like everybody else talks and yelling out these profane words and telling these dirty jokes. I mean, what? what? Why don't you, what, what gives? Why, why don't you do that? Well, you ought to be able to tell them. You ought to be able to boldly speak forth. This is why I don't do that. And, and be that kind of a testimony. In verse 8, Paul says, For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth. From these believers in Thessalonica, the word of the Lord began to be spoken forth. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, he says, but in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out. Is that true of you? Is that true of me? Has our faith in God gone out, or is it something that we just shut up in, inside? Oh, you know what? I trusted Jesus as my Savior about 35 years ago, but I don't want nobody to know it. I've kept it a good secret. That's not how God designed it. Your faith has gone out. Paul says, we don't even need to say anything about it because it's already gone forth. What an, what an example and what an encouragement for us today to, to live for Christ, to be a testimony for him, and especially to be so when opposition and persecution comes our way. Number three, the evidence found that Paul knew was alive in these people is that they turned from that which was false to serve the true and the living God. They turned away from that which is false. Verse 9, he said, they declare what manner of entry we had to you, and, and, and hear this, how you turn to God from idols to serve the true and the living God. What a, what a testimony. They turned from idols to serve the true and the living God. They didn't keep just the same old lifestyle. They didn't keep doing the things that were totally contrary to, to what God had said. They didn't continue living a life that was totally different from the standard of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were consistent in serving the Lord and living by faith. You know, in that day and time, idol worship was a big deal. There were temples, places of worship erected that that people could go and worship false gods. And there, were, there, were, there was immorality, acts of immorality that was even associated at those temples with the worship of false gods. And by the way, we still have a problem with idol worship in our day as well. Now, it happens all over the world, but now in America, people may not be going to temples and 
participating in that type of idol worship to a false god. They may not be buying or making a statue that resembles some god and, and, and honor that god and worship that god. But I want to tell you, people have idols of many varieties in our day and time. And it could be true of some of us here today that we have idols in our life. What's an idol? It's anything that gains your allegiance and your loyalty above the Lord Jesus Christ has become an idol in your life. It can be work. It can be a hobby. It can be sports. It can be any number of things. But it has a higher loyalty and allegiance than the Lord Jesus Christ. It's an idol in your life. And these believers had sincerely turned to God. They turned away from those idols. They left their life of sin to serve the true and the living God. There is no higher calling in all the world than to serve the true and the living God. Number four. And I can list this in, in several ways, and I actually had it listed a different way, and I marked it out last night, and I just put it like this, longing to see Jesus. Now, I'm going to tell you something about people who aren't saved. They don't want to see Jesus. People who are not saved do not love Jesus. They have no desire for Jesus, and they do not want to see Jesus. And they certainly don't want to go live with Jesus. I'm going to tell you, these people had a longing for Jesus because in verse 10, he says that not only had they turned from idols to serve the living and true God, but he says also to wait, to wait for his son, for God's son, from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Now, these people were looking forward to Jesus. And that's the encouragement you and I as Christians have. The encouragement is that Jesus is coming again. We sing about it. We read about it. We preach about it. And that's our hope. And that's what we're to be looking forward to, the return of Jesus Christ. Now, it is God's Son that's returning. It is Jesus. It is the one who died on the cross for our sin, who paid for all of our sin debt in full, who was buried but rose again, the Bible says, even Jesus, and he's the one, the Bible says, delivers us from the wrath to come. You see, these Thessalonians believers believed that Jesus was alive. They knew he was alive. And they knew he was coming back because Paul had already taught them that. And they were looking for him to return. The word wait there is in present tense. It means that their hope of Christ's return was alive. It was active. They expected him to return at any moment and knew that he could return at any time. And he did not return in their day. But he may return in our day. And someone says, well, but he may not return in our day. He may not. But we're to still be looking for him. And we're to still be desiring him. We're to still be longing for his return. Now, I don't know about you, but there is a desire that I have in my heart to see Jesus. If somebody's a child of God and they've been saved by the grace of God, and they don't care about seeing Jesus face to face, in person. I've got a problem with that. Because Jesus ought to be the love of our heart, and we should be longing for him to return. And the Bible says that wrath is, a day of wrath is coming. It has to. Humanity is sinful and has rebelled against God. The Bible says that, that the day of his wrath is set. But those glorious news that in Jesus Christ we are delivered, we are rescued from the wrath that is to come. And that's our great expectation. 
Let me close with this verse of Scripture. This, this is how Paul puts it in the book of Titus, chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. He says, teaching us that denying ungodliness, refusing ungodliness, and worldly lust, we should live soberly. We should live righteously. We should live godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope. And what is that? The glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, if you've never placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says that you're under the sentence of condemnation and that God's wrath abides on you. And that's terrible news. And there's a terrible result that comes from that. But the good news is you have the opportunity to turn to the Lord today, to confess yourself as a sinner in his sight, which we all are. All have sinned to come short of the glory of God. But if we simply come to him, confess our sinfulness and our need for him, and by faith believe in the Lord Jesus Christ who came from heaven, lived a perfect life, died on the cross as our substitute. Yes, he was buried, but on the third day he rose again. And he ascended back to heaven to sit at the Father's right hand until that day when the Father said, Son, go get my children. That day could be quickly approaching. It could be right upon us. And you'd be left behind. If you've never trusted Christ, I invite you to do so. I also in invite our, our church to a time of prayer. and Musicians will come. We've emphasized the time of prayer for our church during this time. and There may be things on your heart that you need to pray about today that's specific to this message about how you live your life and, and, and so forth. And God's applied it to your life in some way. It may be that, uh, that today there's someone on your heart that you really want to pray for. Maybe some burden on, on your heart. But... We have emphasized that we all as a church pray specifically for our nation. For COVID-19 and all the results of that and how it's affected us. And I'm so glad that we're able to come back today in spite of that, that things are moving forward. But not just COVID-19, but also the healing of our nation, the division that our nation has and the the trouble our nation is in, and for the upcoming el election to take place in November, on November the 3rd, uh, we just need to be praying for that. And so during this time, this is your opportunity to respond to how God has touched your heart and for all of us to be praying about these matters together as a church. So let's spend this time uh, with the Lord.
there's hope for the hopeless and all those who've strayed. Come sit at the table, come taste the grace. There's rest for the weary, rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can cure. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. Oh, wanderer, come home. You're not too far. So lay down your hurt, lay down your heart, come as you are, come as you are, come as you are, fall in his arms, there's joy for the morning. O oh, sinner, be still, earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal, earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. got one question, and it's for Kyle Williams. Where is your sister? Okay. Uh, they were supposed to be here at 1145. Did you know, you knew that, right? Yeah, okay. They, they, didn't, they didn't tell you. Okay. Okay, let me just kind of tell you what's going on here. Um, a little girl named Brooklyn Fish, age of 10, has trusted Christ as her Savior. Now, this was, uh, this was back months ago, about the time COVID hit. Now, Brooklyn's grandmother is Kyle's sister, Kim Williams. Kim has a number of underlying health conditions. She's had some serious health problems. It wasn't maybe a couple of years ago. I mean, she just almost died. May have died, and they brought her back. That's how serious her condition is. So she can't be around. She's very careful about crowds, okay? So uh, the thought was this little girl's been waiting for months. She wants to be baptized. And so... We thought, well, restrictions have eased up a little bit. Kim has to be very, very careful. So the, the thought was that the family would come about at the end of our service so they could slip in, come to the front row. We could go get dressed, and then we could, I could baptize Brooklyn. Okay, and they're here, all right? So I wasn't running overtime. They were just running a little bit late, all right? Uh, the one time I get finished right on time, see? Uh, so that's what we're going to do. And uh, I think Mike and, and them are going to sing a little bit. So we, 
It's going to take us a few minutes to get dressed and then do the baptism. I'd like for you to stay uh, for the baptism, if you will, to encourage this family and this little girl. Good job. I mean, look, you want something done, ask him. And man, he's, you're quick. Uh, so my, uh, Michelle and Sonny are going up to, to help get things ready. And I will present Brooklyn to you when she, when she comes in. We'll go get dressed. Uh, Mike will lead you in, in more songs and worship. So we may get out just a little bit later uh, than normal. But that's okay today, isn't it, for today? Uh, we can do that. No, 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 nothing to be sorry about. I mean, things happen when people are trying to get, get things together and get ready and try to be at a place at a certain time. Amen. So we'll, let's wait for them to get, get in. But thank you for being here today. Isn't it great to be able to get come back for a little bit more normal service, uh, to have, have our Sunday school uh, back today and have children's church back? Uh, we're still not uh, ready for Wednesday night. I'm not sure exactly what we're going to do there. We've got some work to do try to get some things lined up there, but uh, when we get ready for Wednesday night, uh, we will let you know, and I'll send out a message, and we'll get the word out. This is Brooklyn K. Fish. Did I get that right? Okay. And uh, Brooklyn has trusted Jesus as her Savior. Uh, we have met. We've talked about uh, salvation. We've talked about baptism and why a person's baptized and when they're baptized, how they're baptized. And uh, she is ready to get that done. And so I present her to you uh, as a new believer in Christ to be baptized and become a member of our church. And uh, if you're excited uh, for Brooklyn and glad that she's made this important decision, would you say, let her know that by saying amen. amen? Amen. All right. Well, let's go get changed, okay? Uh, here's the plan. The preacher asked me on the way down for us to do a couple of three songs that we've already done this morning. We're going to do one, and we're going to do something else. Sing with us. Oh. 
draw me close to you. Never let me go. I lay it all down again to hear you say that I'm your friend. Now sing with us. You are my desire. No one else will do. Cause nothing else could take your place to feel the warmth of your embrace. Help me find the back to you You're all I want You're all I've ever needed You're all I want Help